Welcome to Prison Professors. I am Michael Santos, and today I get to introduce you to somebody who's been an inspiration to me, and I think he'll be an inspiration to you. I've been reading about Glenn Martin for many years. He's what really, it's, it, what really gets me excited about him is he's very passionate about improving outcomes of the criminal justice system. In fact, he has been responsible for launching a lot of movements, including closing prisons and really just bringing awareness to the wretchedness of mass incarceration. And, and so I'm going to ask Glenn to tell us how he started building this career, what he is doing now, but most importantly, I think you're going to see how important it is for you to use your time in prison to start preparing for success. So Glenn, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to join us at Prison Professors. When I reached out and said we reached people in prison, you were so generous and said, yeah, absolutely, those are our brothers and sisters, and we want to help. Could you give us a little background about your experience with the system and what makes you passionate about wanting to change it? Sure. Thanks for that question. And thanks for inviting me to be here. You know, many years ago, as a young man, I got arrested in New York for shoplifting and ended up on Rikers Island. And back then in New York, if you were 16, you were charged as an adult. So I really had the adult experience of one of the worst jails in the country at the age of 16. And I would argue that, you know, my sort of fire in my belly on around advocacy started then. The idea that this is the best society has to offer for a 16-year-old charged with uh, shoplifting, a case that ended up being dismissed. Um, and then sus subsequently served time in prison and was really just taken aback at the fact that we lock up some of America's best and brightest. And that's not really the story we tell about who we uh, see in prison, who's incarcerated, who's doing time, because the truth is many of the successes that I can point to today in my life actually come from conversations that I remember vividly and skills that I learned from people I was incarcerated with. So what you say you went in there at 16 years old. What was the expectation of how long you'd be in there? You know, the first time I went in, I, I had $1,500 bail, but I was really poor. And so $1,500 might as well have been $15 million. Um, but the first time I was in and out in a very short amount of time, though I got into a fight in the bullpen and ended up getting stabbed while I was 16 years old with a pen that was melted into a shank. And then later on, uh, served time, had nine years, served six of those nine years. Um, but it was a different story the second time around because I was exposed to what I would argue was a pretty exceptional opportunity. I had the chance to go to college while I was in prison and earn a quality two-year liberal arts degree. When you said you got stabbed in the bullpen at Rikers, were you with an adult, was it an adult who stabbed you or another adolescent? It was another adolescent, but if you know anything about Rikers, you have two choices, predator or prey. And he came to me and said, give me your jacket. And I knew I had to fight and we got into a fight. And before I knew it, I was fighting about five guys and literally within seconds, it felt like hours. Um, but I realized that one of them was stabbing me with a pen. Wow. Well, that's a tough, tough way to get initiated into the system. And you got out. How long were you out before you went back with that nine year sentence? Yeah. You know, if you know anything about people who are in the streets and in trouble, they're sort of in and out, in and out, in and out. And the first few times, you know, you get a bunch of get out of jail free cards, right? Like it feels like you know, you're just sort of cycling through the system. What you don't realize is that the system is setting you up for the big hit. And so all of this spanned over about, I don't know, seven years, eight years or so. So in my early 20s, found myself back in the system. My first offer was 20 to 40. Um, but luckily at that point, I had resources to hire a pretty good attorney, um, but still ended up with nine years. So nine years in the state of New York prison system, most of the guys that I communicate with are in federal prisons, but I know a lot of them have that similar background where we come from disadvantaged um, you know, communities without as many opportunities. Many of us were poor. Uh, many of us did not have an education or positive role models, but somehow you got inspired when you went in for that nine year sentence, you said to, to enroll in school. What kind of student were you before you went to that system? You know, when I talk to people about mass incarceration, it can feel really daunting um, and uh, such a for formidable system that people feel as though there's not much they can do about it. But the truth is that a correction counselor, when I was going through orientation in state prison, said to me, look at your grades, you should go to college. And it was such a surreal moment because obviously it was one of the lowest points of my life. But I always tell that story so that people realize 
that, you know, everyone's not going to go to the White House to try to change policy, right? Sometimes a conversation with someone where you see something in them that they didn't even see, don't even see in themselves in that moment can really change the trajectory of someone's life. And that's really what happened for me. I ended up 10 hours away from home, which is the opposite of what anyone wants when they go to prison. But it was a college program that was born out of the Attica Rebellion decades earlier. And so I felt privileged going to this college program, knowing people literally died for it. And I found myself uh, traveling to places uh, through books um, that I hadn't been able to travel to as a poor person growing up in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn as a young person. And then also, as you can imagine, it's not just about the college degree as a tool, which is important, but also the ability to show people you can start something and finish it. And even more importantly, the camaraderie and the fellowship of going to college with other people who are trying to better themselves. Like those experiences, I'll never forget. That's really important for people to see because even though somebody may have made a decision or been been part of an environment that led to them coming to prison. One thing I really like highlighting in stories like yours is that it's never too early and never too late to start sowing seeds for a better life. And what's super inspiring to me is that you got that vision at the start of a, of a journey inside of a high security penitentiary. Um, you found that by going to school, you could associate yourselves with others who wanted to improve their life. And then I know, and you and, I, and our viewers will know as they listen deeper into this video, that the lessons you learned in prison ended up having a massive influence on a really uh, cr uh, important career that has, an in that has had an impact on the lives of millions of people and, is, and still has a lot, uh, the, this impact. Could you tell us about how that education contributed, first of all, to the nine years that you served, but the, 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 the opportunities that opened for you as a result when you came out as well. Yeah, thanks for that. As we talk more and more about my successes, I want people to hear that every success I've ever achieved rests on a foundation of failure. The truth is that I've learned most of the lessons in my life when I was in some of the darkest places. And yet those lessons have taught me the things I needed to know as I've achieved success and maintained success. And we'll touch on some of those things. Um, I would say that, you know, coming out of prison, I had this degree and I'm looking for a job just like anyone else. And I don't want to be, you know, romanticize what the experience was like. I came out, I had a difficult time finding employment, maintaining housing, all the things you would imagine associated with having a criminal record. But the thing that I had that was new and different was one, fortitude. Um, I became very resilient after the experience of serving time. But also I had a range of uh, ways of thinking about myself and how I show up in the world. I placed myself differently in the world. And so even uh, when I went to visit an employee and I was turned down solely based on a criminal record, I just decided that there were just too many options out there, too many opportunities available for me to give up. And I landed at a nonprofit public interest law firm, which was, uh, I had no clue what that, that was at the time. I say it in a sophisticated way now, but really didn't understand where I was. I was answering the phones at the front desk. Um, I owed $83,000 in fine fees, restitution, um, but I saw opportunity and I knew I was around a bunch of attorneys, civil rights attorneys, very well Ivy League educated attorneys who were doing really important work around criminal justice reform. And I saw a chance to learn from them. And I saw a chance to give back, particularly to the people I left behind. To, to the guy, Howie, who taught me how to take apart computers and put them back together. We only had five computers in the entire facility for 2,000 people. But Howie not only taught me how to use the computer, but he literally taught me how to take apart the hardware and put it back together because that's the only way we'd be able to maintain five computers for 2,000 people. Um, and then uh, really learn from these attorneys how to do pretty sophisticated policy advocacy work understood how government works, uh, how bills are moved forward, how to change policy, started developing the kinds of relationships that become currency in life. You know, I always tell people I'm not concerned about the cash in my wallet, I'm concerned about the names in my cell phone. Because the truth is I, I immediately somehow knew from, I guess from all the reading I did while I was on the inside of the importance of building networks 
And every single person I've ever met, I assume they're going to go on and be someone that I'm going to develop a deeper relationship with. And I have stories of people going from being an intern for me on a research project to being the deputy director of the Human Resources Administration and me needing them to sign off on a bill that I'm trying to move through the legislature. So I've been around long enough now to see people grow up and end up in really important places and vice versa. I've had people uh, who supported me when I was just a formerly incarcerated dude trying to figure it out and now are able to come to me for a job. I have people who work for me um, who at the time in the beginning had no clue where I was going to end up. And I looked up to them and the truth is now they're on my staff. That is awesome. I'm, I'd like to get a couple of clarifying questions in there because you just gave me so much information that really aligns with what participants in our program preparing for success after prison learn. One of them, uh, I'm going to ask you, just based on listening to you, I think you, you must have gotten out when you were about 30, 28? Yeah, good guess. I was 30. So I've been out now uh, since 2000. So you figure I've been out 23 years. Okay. So you got out when you were about 30. And during this time, could I ask you what level of commit, like what, 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 how would you have defined success in your life when you were 28? Let's say you're getting out, you don't know what's coming, you know the recidivism rates because you've been locked up for your, all of your 20s. What does success mean to you at that stage? When you're 27, before you get out? Yeah, so at 20, I've always been entrepreneurial. So I've always known that I had the ability to sort of uh, be sophisticated in my thinking and want to lead something and want to build something. Didn't really know how to go from concept to brick and mortar, if you will. Um, it would take me many, many, many years to learn that and many hard lessons. Um, but I am someone who knows that you can get knocked down nine times as long as you get up 10 times. And so I, I always had this entrepreneurial spirit. Having said that, I also realized that I needed to spend some time learning from other people, watching other people, having other people give me feedback, and even learning from their mistakes. And so I started out with a level of humility that I think served me well. It wasn't easy. I mean, I lived in a place that was miles and miles away from work, without a car, taking the train every day, sometimes walking to work because I didn't have enough money to pay for the train. Um, that humility served me well, especially because I started out in the hole because of how much money I owed in fines, fees, restitutions, and so on. But the way I would have described success back then was to not be in debt, um, to have a job that paid my bills, to have health care, to have a small group of friends, and to have a vision for myself that I was constantly working toward every day. So what I didn't hear in that message that I hope people in prison will also recognize is he success didn't have anything to do with controlling the television room. It didn't have anything to do with um, trying to be a shot caller in the prison. Success didn't have anything to do with trying to have this image of prison that the best way to serve time is to forget about the outside world and focus on your time in prison. It was everything about really defining his life and being the CEO of his life. And that's a lesson that we are asking you to do. Right. Glenn, you're going to hear through this interview is a guy that controls millions of dollars in revenues right now, uh, is responsible for providing jobs and paying taxes. And he's no different from any other CEO, just like you can be. You've got to be recognizing, though, he is not sitting inside of a prison and trying to stay in prison. That's what mass incarceration does is it teaches people how to live in prison. But the more you learn how to live in prison, the less likely you, you are to function in society. I hope you got that message from our course, and I hope you're hearing it from Glenn just like I'm hearing it from Glenn. It doesn't matter who yeah. I interview. If he's successful, they've got a mindset like Glenn Martin, and you've got to ask yourself the question, do you want to be successful like Glenn Martin, or do you want to control the TV room? Because the choice is yours. Yeah, I got, I got two quick stories on that. Um, on my way out of prison, um, a correction officer on my housing unit, and I'm not going to vilify all correction officers. My older brother grew up to be a federal correction officer in a federal prison. Now he's a U.S. Marshal. Um, but one of the correction officers looked at me and it made a very snide remark. He said, you being here helped me get my boat. And when your son gets here, he's going to help my son get his boat. And that was difficult to hear. And maybe, honestly, that's how he genuinely felt or he was just taking one last swing at me. 
Um, but it was important for me to hear. It actually ended up being a motivator because I did everything I could afterwards to make sure my son is not going to help his son buy a boat. In fact, my son goes to one of the most expensive private schools in the United States at this point because I can afford it. Um, and then there's another story where a, uh, a sergeant on the way out of the facility, you know, they have to check your ID and make sure they're letting go the right person, if you will. And he was sort of checking me out of the facility. And he said, did you just get here? I said, no, I've been here for five years. He said, no way. I know everybody here. I said, no, no, no. You know the people here who get in trouble. You don't know me because I've been working hard on what I'm going to do after I leave this facility. So with all due respect, you not knowing me is a gift to me. And I'll never forget that moment. Like both of those moments stay with me and uh, help to motivate me. But I think the second one in particular speaks to exactly what you just said. Yeah. Like I couldn't care less about what was happening in the day room, except I hated seeing guys get hurt over a television program. And that's what we're trying to unpack in here, that I'm not giving you anything that I didn't learn from leaders. I wish that, to say that I created all of these those 10 steps that, that are in our course. But the truth is, when I saw a leader like Glenn Martin, I listened and I learned and I wanted to emulate that kind of behavior. And that's why all of our courses are suggesting, listen, develop those critical thinking skills and good listening skills. So when somebody is telling us the pathway to success, we try to incorporate that into our life. Learn, listen to how Glenn speaks. He does not speak as if he's a man who served nine years in prison. He's a man who speaks, who has an education, which is the, the second module in our course. If you can define success as what you want, you got to take that second path and set those super clear goals that align with how you've defined success. And that's what Glenn did. He devoted his time to going to school, earning academic credentials, learning, and not defining himself by what other people think. The reality is the longer we expose people to corrections in society, the less likely those people are to overcome and become successful. This is an anomaly. This is, a, this is the roadmap that we want for everybody in our community. Glenn doesn't have to be here. I don't have to be here. But our hearts are still with you, and that's why we're, we're so excited to bring this message. The third thing I heard from you in your background story, Glenn, that I hope our listeners heard, is that when you found a way to get into that prestigious law office and, and work, you didn't care that you were just answering the phone. There's a lot of guys who will have an ego issue involved and says, oh, how, who's this guy from Harvard or Yale? He's no better than I am. But that wasn't Glenn's model. It was let me learn. Let me recognize that the people I know are currency. Let me recognize that networking is super important. I mean, this is the, this is the hallmark of leadership. And yeah. you could start that in prison and maybe you can ev uh, evaluate. I think that's why opportunities open for him because first of all, as we have in the course, you become aware of opportunities that you can create or seize, but then the world becomes aware of you and they start investing in you. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that trajectory after prison. Yeah. Let me tell you a little bit more about uh, being at the law firm. Um, I'm going to jolt your listeners for a second because not only are some of them thinking what you just described, but I was making $16,000 a year. This was 23 years ago, but this was New York City. I was making $16,000 a year, but I had six positions there before I left. Every time a position opened up and I felt like I could do 70% of the job, I would apply for it, put my best foot forward and get that promotion and learn the other 30% on the job, if you will, and took my salary from 16,000 a year to 73,000 73, a year in a relatively short amount of time, and then left there to earn 98,000 a year somewhere else, which we can talk about in a second. But you're absolutely right. I mean, look, no job is gonna be perfect, especially for an entrepreneur, right? You're always thinking about how you, if you were the leader, would do things differently, but, when I go look for an opportunity, I ask myself, what are the opportunities beyond even just the salary itself? And there, there were just a tremendous amount of opportunities. I mean, I found myself in rooms with the mayor of the city of New York, the governor of the state of New York, Bishop Desmond Tutu, uh, former Supreme Court uh, uh, Judge Sandra Day O'Connor. Like they were opportunities that have contributed to the rest of my life in that place that were just far and apart from the actual salary that was being earned. And that's a, a super key point that he's giving us is that not every relationship 
<clears throat> is going to be transactional, where you get paid, right? Glenn's not getting paid to come here and speak with you. I'm not getting paid to do this. This is something that we're passionate about. But opportunities can open for this. In my case, I can meet more administrators. I could say, hey, let me feed you this type of content for free. And as a result, that can open a relationship with a warden, with an administrator, with a director of a prison system. They said, yeah, we want to get that type of content in here. There's no financial transaction from that. But from that relationship, I can go to a CEO of a $50 million company and I say, hey, could you sponsor this kind of information because we, the, the prison's not going to support people in prison. Uh, the institution's not going to pay for it. I, I'll, my company will pay for a portion of it, but I want others to get involved. So it's this, this cycle that you have to figure out how to create. Too many people in prison are thinking about, well, who's going to pay me for that? And that's not the mindset that I heard from Glenn. It's what I want you to listen and learn. And you're going to hear it as we continue, because not only did Glenn become a super stud in nonprofit and in policy shifting and in influencing leadership, but he's also become a real maverick in business and, and being a part of the digital community and training and coaching. And you can do the same thing, but you've got to listen to the path. Don't come out of jail and think, I'm going to be like Glenn Martin and put my kid in the most expensive school. Be willing to sow the seeds, do the work, and open those opportunities. We're here to show you how to do it, but nobody should work harder than you to make it happen. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that trajectory of going from uh, these jobs that make 100K and then advancing to where you're in the top, you know, three, four, five percent of the nation of earners. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, just yesterday, uh, before we got on air, I talked about traveling last week. I went to uh, California and then Detroit. What? You went then, to California? You didn't see me? <laughs> I was way up in the mountains, way up in the mountains. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I came back and uh, I knew I was going to speak to a bunch of students at NYU yesterday, literally right off the airplane. And that was a very deliberate decision. I'm not getting paid to go speak to 100 NYU students, but... Um, those 100 NYU students are going to go on and help run this city someday. And I wanted to plant, plant the seeds of change in those young, impressionable minds, um, because these are the people who emerged to end up uh, helping to run this city. And also the professor himself is a journalist and writes for a bunch of different outlets. And I never know when I need to pick up the phone and call a journalist and ask him or her to write an important story about something that's happening in criminal justice. So it was just a win-win. The students got exposure to someone who's led very complex policy advocacy campaigns. And I essentially planted seeds that are gonna grow into a tree that's gonna cast shade that someday hopefully I'll benefit from, but if not, I'm sure someone will. And so yes, that's some of my thinking when I decide where to spend my time. The truth is I could go somewhere else and get paid thousands per hour for my time these days. But for me, there's value in those relationships that go beyond the dollar amount. You're absolutely right. So after leaving the law firm, I went uh, to a large reentry organization in New York, one of the lo uh, longest standing reentry organizations. And I went there to do advocacy work, to rebrand that organization, to help them fundraise. I took over marketing, communications, development, um, and part of their programmatic activity. It was a $10 million annual budget. I grew it to about 22 million before I left. They're at 60 million now. Why do I bring up that story? Um, because at that moment, I thought I was gonna start my own nonprofit. And one of the largest funders in New York City looked me in the face and said, you're not ready. You need to go learn from someone else. And it was jolting at the moment, but she was 100% right. Like me going to this large complex reentry organization and learning as one of the executives was uh, a huge foundation for me going on and then building my own organization. And when I built my own organization, I was able to raise $43 million in four years. And that would have been impossible six years earlier when I joined the reentry organization. And then to be able to go from building that organization, hiring 50 people, opening three offices, meeting the president of the United States, helping to influence policy and so on, um, all of that rests on things that people often don't see. People often see the successful person. And this is before we even talk about my venture into the private sector. Um, and people make huge assumptions about how you got there. You know, if you see a turtle on top of a pole, someone helped put him there. Like he didn't get there on his own. 
A lot of people helped to uh, put me into positions of success. And don't forget the story about me living miles and miles away for my $16,000 a year job and me walking miles to work every day because I didn't have $2.50 to get on the train. That part of the story gets lost on so many people, particularly people coming out of prison and seeing someone like me and saying, I want to be like him. If you want to be like me, pay attention to the steps it took me to get there. Pay attention to the days where I'm telling you things were difficult and I wanted to give up, but I did not. Because those are similarly part of the story. It's not just the successful part of the story. It's the steps it took me to get there that are equally important. And then I hope we get a chance to talk about my foray into the private sector. Yeah, well, we've got we've got an hour on these shows, so I'm very happy that you devoted that time. As you heard, he gets paid thousands of dollars an hour, and he's here devoting it to you. The one thing that we ask is the, is you recognize this is not a show that is is meant to be designed for you just to have entertainment. There will also be a workbook assigned with this sh with this program. Um, you're going to learn how to how are you applying these critical thinking skills to your life. One thing that I cannot stand here when I go, I stand to hear when I go into prisons and I speak with guys in prison is they'll say, well, they don't offer these programs here. Well, these things aren't available here. Nobody should work harder than you. And there's nothing stopping you from learning how to read more effectively, to ask better questions, to develop your vocabulary, to develop your verbal communication skills, your writing skills. Those are the, 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 the resources that are going to help you become more like Glenn. And, and I want you to listen and learn to that and not only listen to his message, but also go through the accompanying lesson that we will include with this, with this video. So definitely, um, and, and there was also something, he said he raised $43 million. And that number is incomprehensible to a lot of people in prison. I would, I'll bet that when he started going to school, back in wherever it was, uh, um, Attica or whatever prison you were in, the concept of being able to raise $43 million would have been uh, incomprehensible. But there's a flip side to that too. That doesn't mean when you're raising $43 million, it's not to live this in this life of luxury. My guess is you were probably making a couple hundred grand a year, if that, okay? His focus was making an impact on the lives yeah. of others. And yeah. these are all part of that stage, right? You're you're persuading, and I'm going to ask him to elaborate on it, but my guess is going to be he's persuading high net worth individuals and businesses and agencies and municipalities to believe in his vision because he's a visionary. Yeah. And then yeah. they're, they're believing in the vision. He's earning a good living as he definitely deserves it. But all of that, puts him in this position now he's in the private sector where he commands whatever the market will bear so could you help our audience really understand all of this is part of a stepping stone to success it's not overnight you know they always say uh, uh, overnight success is 20 years in the making and that's exactly what i'm hearing from glenn it began inside of a prison and it and then it, that 100 percent commitment to success led him to where he is right now yeah um you know, in my nonprofit career, I've never earned more than 150 grand a year. And uh, it's almost laughable now. I'll tell you why in a second. But um, that's pretty much the height of my earning, 150, 160. In and fact, that was controlling a budget of how much annually? Uh, $7 million. So look at that. Just take that nugget of information. Imagine the discipline and the commitment and the honor and good character. He had the ability, the control over $7 million, but he had the discipline to say, hey, I'm going to pay myself a reasonable salary. And, and 150 in New York is a reasonable salary. It's not right. extraordinary, it's not excessive, especially when he had the, the, the ability to influence how $7 million was deployed. That's honor, and that's what you have to be thinking about. But I know that's not your situation now. Walk them through uh, uh, that that um, what you were that story you were telling before I interrupt it. Yeah, sure. So you know, in the nonprofit sector, honestly, I didn't think really hard about earning more money. I mean, everyone wants to be able to survive. I live in a city like New York where it's very expensive to live, but it wasn't my primary driver. You're right. My primary driver was the liberation of people in our criminal justice system. 
what could I do to make things a little bit easier for people in the system and to get people out of the system who didn't belong there? That was a huge driver for me for many, many years. Um, I was introduced to the nonprofit sector, as I said, within months of coming home from prison. And that became the vehicle for me to see what I could do to help people in the system. Having said that, in 2018, um, I took some time off, traveled a bit, really tried to get exposure. I realized I had worked so hard uh, over those 17 years that I just didn't spend enough time um, taking vacation and, you know, just really uh, recontextualizing uh, myself and how I fit into the world and how else I could be successful. And always knew, again, that I was entrepreneurial, did a great job as a social justice entrepreneur, if you will, but wanted to try more traditional entrepreneurship and realized that all the skills that I had learned over the 17 years to help build a nonprofit and help other people, that there were a lot of people out there who didn't have those skills and who would actually pay for those skills. And I built a nonprofit consultancy where I and a handful of others, uh, every single one of them formerly incarcerated, um, now give guidance to other visionaries who are trying to go from having an idea to building something. That's the thing about entrepreneurs. That's the thing about visionaries. Um, you shouldn't make the assumption that just because a person has one set of skills, that they have the range of skills needed to build something. And any good leader also knows you have to hire your weakness. You surround yourself with people who can sort of fill the gaps. That's just what it looks like. Even today, as sophisticated as I am, I have people on my team who are much better at specific things than I will ever be. And I give them the space to lead. Hire talented people, give them the space to lead, keep them motivated, things I've learned over the years. And so this particular business uh, grows $2 million last year. Uh, the business is about five or six years old at this point. Um, but it started out with just me thinking I was just going to be a consultant out there trying to earn a couple of hundred grand a year. Um, that has ballooned into about 600 grand a year from that particular business after expenses and so on. And then about a year and a half later, because I'm a fan of like, put it, give your business 100% of yourself before you move on to build something else. Give yourself the chance to actually be successful by putting your all into it. But once I felt like I got it off the ground, it had a life of its own. I was surrounded by talented people. Uh, the brand um, could live beyond just my sort of being in every single room. I decided to move into the real estate uh, sector, which is something I've always thought about. And, you know, people think real estate and they think you're going to get rich overnight. I just haven't found that rich overnight thing. I go to the bodega all the time and I buy lottery tickets. I think that's the closest I'm ever going to get to rich overnight because real estate, I just started buying houses one by one by one and learning some really hard lessons about what it actually takes to be successful in real estate. Today, I own 90 properties um, four and a half years later. And what's What's actually interesting about this, at least I find it interesting, is I earn really good money, as you can imagine. Uh, I do real estate coaching. I do nonprofit coaching, executive coaching. I get paid really well. Sometimes I get paid thousands for an hour of my time, as I mentioned earlier. But I've also found ways to do good and do well. I have found that when I talk to my management companies about who I want in my properties, I'm able to say to them, especially in the uh, lower income areas where I purchase, that I want people who've been involved in the criminal justice system in my houses, that I want people who are on Section 8 in my houses. And it blows their mind because some of these companies totally screen people out. And I'm trying to not just do the right thing uh, in terms of my own business practices and build a business based on my values, but also something I've done my whole life, which is to try to re-educate decision makers about how to think about people coming out of prison and how to create opportunities for them. So that blend of do good, do well, um, makes me feel good about moving into the private sector, but also being who I've always been and what I promised the guys that I left behind in prison. And, and there's, there's so much to unpack in that segment there. One of them I, I want to ask him about based on what I just heard. Um, do you know my friend Jay Jordan? I do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so one of the things that are in common with Glenn and Jay, and some of you may have seen my interview with Jay Jordan. I met Jay Jordan when we both got out of prison around the same time. Um, and when I, I was launching a venture or th considering launching a venture a couple of, about a year ago, and I wanted Jay to be a part of it, 
and one of the things that Jay said with the humility that I just heard Glenn say is Jay runs a, a nonprofit that, I don't know, $40, $50 million in annual, you know, um, uh, uh, expenditures or whatever. And he said, look, there's five people on my team. Any one of them could be the CEO. <laughs> Any of them, they're all smarter than I am. They all know a lot more than I am. I know the skill that I bring to the table. I have the experience of being involved in gangs, of coming from the inner city, of transforming my life. And I, have, I bring that currency. That's what Glenn just told us. And I'm going to drill into that transition from public uh, policymaker to private sector businessman. But, but, but the, key, the key point is, is you always recognize, I've got to surround myself with people that are smarter than me. There's a flip side to that. People that are smarter than you will not align with you if you're not 100% committed. You, yeah. They've got to see in you, hey, we're all after the same good. And they didn't become, they're not smart just because they have a degree. They're smart because they know how to navigate the complexities of life. And if we can associate ourselves with those people, they will invest in us. And that's how you, 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 you know, bring value on a much bigger scale. And clearly, Glenn has, has a life story of growing on a much bigger scale. Your, our question for you is, are you going to be like Glenn and like Jay and like others who've emerged successfully or are you going to be like the guy who's in prison telling you the best way to serve time is to forget about the world outside and focus on your time in here? How many times did you hear that in prison, if you could remember, Glenn? Oh, uh, yeah, over and over. You can't, you know, don't let the time do you. You do the time. Focus on where you are, et cetera, et cetera. Let me tell you, earlier I said uh, all of my success rests on failure. And I'm going to reinforce that by telling a quick uh, story. When I went to the reentry organization from the law firm to work, I essentially created my own job. Um, I'm a big fan of like, there are no throwaway conversations. You always have the opportunity to plant your vision with someone else and create opportunity for yourself. So I convinced them to hire me. I helped them understand the salary I wanted. And I committed to them that within a year, I would raise enough money to cover my salary and they would see value in me being on staff. So they, they, they took the deal, brought me on. Within a year, I had raised millions, a few million, and hired 14 people and took over two, three additional units from what they thought I came in to help them with. I remember having a meeting almost a year in with the CEO of the company who I reported to. And we were in this huge boardroom with this large wooden table and my 14 staff members who I had spent a week being briefed by were sitting around that table and the CEO peppered me with questions about fundraising, about marketing, about program, you name it. I answered every question uh, thoughtfully, thoroughly, and uh, walked out of that room with my head held high, thanking my team for everything they had done to prepare me for the meeting. An hour later, I was going to my supervision meeting with the CEO, and I walked in and I felt like I was on cloud nine. And I was like, hey, how's it going? And what do you think of the meeting? She was like, that was a terrible meeting. I was like, huh? She was like, that was just a terrible meeting. I said, I answered every question. What do you, we're doing well with kicking butt and taking names. She said, do you realize I didn't hear a peep from any of the people sitting around that table? I was like, yeah, but they briefed me and I was able to answer every question. She said, why do you have 14 smart people around you if they can't even lead? They can't shine, they can't lead. It was such a, it was, it, obviously it took the wind out of my sails <laughs> in that moment. But it was such a lesson because I had already known I, already, I had already known that you have to hire really smart people to help you get the job done. What I didn't know was to get your ego out of the way and let them lead. Invest in them. Invest in collective leadership. No one will ever say you're not a good leader just because you have smarter people around you doing doing very specific things. You're right. There's a set of skills and experiences I bring to the table that no one can ever take away, and that'll always be there. That won't change. And now, since that day, I remember that meeting, I spent every minute I can investing in the leadership of people around me as a way to grow my own leadership. That's what confidence is. You're so strong that you don't worry that somebody else is smarter than you, making more money than you, might have more skills than you. It's a, life is about a collaborative effort. And it's about bringing people together and helping everybody around you reach their highest potential. And when you're doing that, you grow stronger. You're never threatened. You're not, your security is not threatened by somebody else's success. That is the mindset of abundance. 
versus what yes. you have a lot of in prison. Uh, yes. It's just the opposite of that. There's only one shot caller. No, you no. can rise to your highest potential out here. Just because Glenn is successful doesn't mean I can't be successful. But if we're both successful, perhaps we can make we could each achieve a higher level of success and help more people bring bring them up with us. We want you to have that mindset of abundance. And Glenn, you're really a model of that, uh, 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 of that message. I would like you to now, we have only have about 20 minutes more because I've got these windows of time in prison and maybe we could do it again. But what I'd really love to hear about now is that transition from, it's, it, it, I, I would say, raising tens of millions of dollars in the nonprofit sector is one skill set and it's a strategy, but you could get other successful people to believe in that because they're after that big impact. When you go into the private sector, and I and I think you said that your consulting business, it is a for-profit entity. Is that correct? It is. Yes. So in the private sector, <clears throat> raising equity is not impossible. You could you could do that, but you're gonna shift. You're gonna you somebody else is gonna own a piece of you. Glenn learned how to do this in only 2018. That's only five years ago. In 2018, he's built a venture that is self-sustaining, that is independent, and that it has multiple income streams, charging people a fee to help them become more successful, but then also charging individuals, as he said, coaching, and then investing. Could you walk us through the kind of the capital stack or the capital structure of how you made that switch from, okay, I'm going to leave policymaking and leadership uh, in the private, in the nonprofit space and go and start building my life for my family and building a legacy where I'm not capped at a buck 50 a year. Now yeah. there's no limit. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, you know, I, I laughed earlier at the salary of a buck 50 per year because there's often days where I'm writing checks for $150,000 these days. And I sort of marvel at that. It would take me 12 months to earn that kind of money. Uh, you know, well, 24 not because you had to save half for taxes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what I was just about to say. <laughs> and so today I write those sort of checks. And uh, one thing I will say is this. I have always realized that you need to be very interested in the person on the other side of the table. You know, when I get on phones with people who I want to work with, whether they are more junior to me, if you will, or I'm only going to work with them on a one off deal or I'm hoping to partner with them and, and make a whole lot of money. I start out wondering who that is on the other side of the table, what motivates them and what is it I can actually contribute to their lives. I know what I want for myself and hopefully we will get there. But I start out really uh, being inquisitive about the people around me and what their needs are and what their goals are and where they come from and so on. How did I learn that? I learned that doing fundraising. I, I have met with some of the wealthiest people in New York and California and elsewhere when I was raising money in the nonprofit sector. And in the beginning, I would come in ready to be transactional to sell them on the idea of you know the advocacy work I was gonna do. And they would always sit me down and say, tell me who you are. Tell me where you, you, know, where you were brought up. Tell me about your family. And I took that lesson and I realized what that was all about. And I actually do that now and I do it sincerely. And I find that it helps me to, helps to, helps me to continue to surround myself with the right people. And it makes other people feel good about themselves and good about a partnership with me and good about working with me. It doesn't always work out and that's okay. That's actually part of the point of the exercise. If you learn that you're not compatible with someone else, you can sort of say to yourself, okay, I'm not going to work with this person. Or you can be thoughtful when you put your contract together about preparing for if things don't go well. I have a lawyer who says to me, uh, business is not about friendship. It's about contracts. So sometimes I'm thinking hard about if this doesn't go well, how do I structure a contract so that we both have an out that feels fair? I'm thinking about the end goal right at the beginning. Not that dissimilar from when I was doing, again, fundraising and so on, really thinking about the end goal I wanted to produce and using that to help guide the steps that I take to get there. The other thing is, you know, honestly, if someone said to me, Glenn, you've purchased 90 houses, walk me through the detail of buying a house, they'd find that I would spend a lot of time helping them understand how to find talented people. It always goes back to that for me. There's still elements of buying homes that I just don't understand, and that's okay. There's some learning curves I don't want to or need to get around. I need to know enough to have a dashboard. When you get in the car, you don't need to know the exact temperature of the engine. You just need to know that it's hovering in the right place so that the car won't break down. 
And I run my business that way. Everything is a dashboard for me. How much do I really need to know here? What is it going to cost me to actually fully get around that learning curve versus finding a really talented person that I can trust where there's uh, a win-win for me, for myself and for that person in business. And that has just continued to serve me well. Um, and I'd say also, you know, you said sky's the limit in business. And that's true. And at the same time, the humility that you mentioned earlier that I have shown in the nonprofit sector, I try to show that as I build my business also, because there's such a thing as, you know, too much too fast. And especially in real estate, if you become over leveraged, you can find yourself in trouble really quickly. And so I find that um, my ability to like literally the patience that I learned while I was in prison has served me so well now in business. There are moments where I want to move 110 miles an hour and I realize that 60 miles an hour is a better speed. And all of those lessons, again, you say this stuff begins when you're sitting in a cell, when you're sitting in a day room, when you're sitting in a class in prison. All those lessons still serve me well. You talked earlier about learning how to read and write well and so on. I remember reading uh, the New York Times every single day and the Wall Street Journal every single day while I was in prison. I'd even read it backwards so I could actually focus on the words that I didn't understand and write them somewhere and look them up in the dictionary. That Those words, that reading, that learning continues to serve me well in uh, business today. Um, I'd say the major difference now in the private sector is as you said, you know, I am not at this point looking for equity partners. So I'm actually looking for talented people where I can deliver and get paid well for the work that we do because I'm just not interested in the equity part. That's just my personal choice um, because I'm trying to build wealth that I can pass on to my children. And I just don't want that to be tethered at this point. I may change my mind later on. Um, but what it means for me is finding ways to bring in enough revenue to make sure the people around me are adequately compensated, that the business has enough revenue so that I'm not dealing with cash flow issues, um, and that I am able to do my best to save as much as possible in taxes so that I can actually build wealth to pass on to my children. Because the truth is, um, when I built my nonprofit organization, the hashtag was half by 2030 to try to cut the number of people under correctional supervision in half by 2030. Why? because my son Joshua is gonna be 18 in 2030. And I'm still very much driven by that. The fact that young black men in this country have a one in three chance of going to prison. And you know, the same thing that drove me to get up every day and build that nonprofit and raise $43 million is driving me today to raise millions of dollars um, to try to keep Joshua uh, out of prison and give him the best chances here in this country. So in lesson eight of our course, which I hope you guys have mastered, there's it never ends. This is an ongoing, this is a master class that you're learning from a master. Lesson eight is about authenticity. And it, it, to be authentic, it's that you, you, you can't fake it, right? I can't go into a prison and pretend to be a shot caller. I'd be laughed out in a second. And there's a flip side to that. You can't come to society and pretend to be that you're ready for success unless you've done it. And to be authentic, that's what you're hearing in Glenn. In that course, you may remember there is this concept that first you have to have a plan. And we heard Glenn's plan from the very beginning. And he was willing to put in the hard work, too. You've got to know the priorities that you have to set. We heard that from Glenn. Get an education. Walk multiple miles to earn 16K a year. Take the next jab and go from 16 to 20 to 50 to 70 to 90. Go to be a nonprofit. First recognize the humility of saying you're not ready and have him say you're right. Learn about leadership, right? That These are the priorities that got him there. Five, you've got to build your tools, tactics, and resources along the way. His own tools, tactics, and resources. By the time he'd raised $43 million, he'd learned that he's got to, his biggest investment is in himself. He's got to get people to believe in him, just like you have to get people to believe in you. Nobody cares that he went to prison when he was 16 or how much time he served. They care about how he responded to that. And that is his real life story. He's sitting with the wealthiest people on the planet and they're saying, tell me about you. And when you can convince them to tell about you, he goes into the private sector and leverages all that intellectual property he's developed and grows it. So what, what I heard though, the, before he got into real estate, he knew that he needed a venture. And wasn't that right that you first started your consulting business, that you expected 
to be happy, make a couple hundred, but then three X, five X that, right? Yep. And, and, and then that provided resources to go into real estate. And, yes. and then success in real estate begets success. Wow, yes. look at, he bought one property, then five. Now he has 90, right? Yeah. But he's got a model of success. We all have to start building our model, our portfolio that demonstrates we are more than the past decisions we made. That's what you should be learning through these courses and applying when you're reading, going through the master classes like with Glenn. Um, when you started that consulting business, could you tell us about getting the first client? How hard was that? What, what resources did you have to build before you went out, like a website, contracts, all these kinds? How much effort did you make in it before you went and got a deal? Yeah, thanks for that. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, brand and spending a lot of time thinking about the brand you want to build and really envisioning that brand after you 10x, right? Build a brand that fits where you want to end up. And so if you look at my logos and on, hey, these are logos that could sit on top of a 200 story building and be pretty impressive. That was very deliberate. And so I always start out building brand and you can do brand on the cheap. You can do it for a thousand bucks, right? Choose your colors, choose the feel you're going for, get a logo that matches the, the feeling you're trying to convey, the thing you want people to be left with. Uh, choose choose, choose vis uh, visuals that if people see it on a desk somewhere years later, like they know right away, oh, I know what that is. That's gem trainers, that's gem real estate. And then I very deliberately tie my brand to myself on purpose. Like everything starts with gem on purpose because I feel like I am the personification of the brand. And so the first thing I did was that, spend some time on brand. And there's people around me who again are smarter than me around graphic design and those sort of things that I just uh, brought on board. And sometimes I barter. So, you know, if I don't want to spend a lot of money, I'll barter with people. Like I'll do some executive coaching. I'll help you with fundraising and you help me figure out how to build this brand. And then I made myself available to other people. Like I made myself an opportunity for others. So I'm a big fan of just like having coffee with multiple people and not walking away from that conversation without making myself an opportunity to them. And so I'll grab coffee. What does that cost me these days? 10 bucks, 12 bucks. And I spend an hour telling people what it is I'm trying to do and how that is an opportunity for them. I know what I want out of it, but I want to be a leader that they want to work with. And so I listen to them. I ask them about the challenges in their business. And then I help them understand how me or me and my team can help. In the beginning, it was just me. And sure enough, I landed my first contract. It was a loss leader. You know, I wouldn't work for that, that amount these days, but I knew it was an in for a brand new nonprofit that was going places. And at the time they had 300,000 and today they have a $6 million annual budget. And it was the best bet I ever made. I still have that client today. And if you look at the amount that I'm on retainer for now, it's about 8X from where I started. So that's a win. And, and it's those little victories that put us in the pathway for new opportunities. I'm hoping that you will take will, will, will take all the lessons in the 10 part course. See that Glenn, I didn't create this. I learned I stole this from guys like Glenn, right? I learned these lessons while I was in prison by studying guys like Glenn. And that's what I'm hoping that you will do. You heard him passing along the lesson of Malcolm X, which we've talked about here, learning your vocabulary, studying the dictionary, reading words backwards. I mean, everything that we are doing, we learn from Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, people that have faced struggle. You have to choose which leaders you want to work, work toward and work to emulate. Glenn, I love, I love the idea of starting building your brand and jam and then, and, and then taking these steps some of our people are getting out of prison. I mean, 650,000 people get out every year. Could you give them some guidance of a brand? And I'll put it in the course as well. We'll put it in the course together as well. But how do people, if they want to get in touch, if they've got to find a way to try and, and become a customer, they're recognizing, I've invested in myself. I think I'm ready. I might want to be a fitness coach. I might want to be, you know, do something. I, I be became a master chef in prison. I learned something. I want to, I became a good maintenance man and I want to start, um, I want to go and manage your, your 90 units and, and make sure that all of your doors are working and your bathrooms are working and let me sell myself to you. How would somebody get in touch with you? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, folks can find me at gemtrainers.com. That's one way to get in touch with me. I'm very responsive. 
That's part of my brand. Very responsive. Uh, folks can find me on Twitter at Glenn E. Martin. But also my name has become part of the brand. And if you look up Glenn E. Martin on most social media vehicles, you will notice that that leads back to me. Um, but the two places where I'm most active is either through my website uh, at gemtrainers.com or through Twitter at Glenn E. Martin. And I'm extremely responsive, which again, goes back to brand. As you think about brand, I would say, you know, if you say to people, uh, tell me about Apple phones, you know, they talk about things like reliable, intelligent, and so on. Apple could make a toilet tomorrow, and people would get in line to buy it, because they've spent a lot of time on brand. So as you think about your own brand, as you walk out of prison, the question is really just to move away from the sophistication part of it. What are the words you want people to use to describe you when you're not around? That's the brand. And if you don't build a brand deliberately, guess what? Your brand, your brand develops regardless. And if you don't do it deliberately, it deliberately can develop in a way that's not going to serve you well. So be thoughtful about brand from the day you walk out. And what the, the, the underlying message in all of that is invest in yourself first. Make sure that you have demonstrated that you are more than what a prosecutor might say to you or a sergeant might say to you or, or, a, or a, an administrator might say to you on the way out. You have to believe in yourself and that becomes an armor that allows you to reach a potential that is significantly higher than anybody could ever expect, maybe in some places even you. Glenn, I really want to thank you for being a part of our community. You, you know, we call everybody that comes on here, you are now a prison professor. We're going to make sure that your message resonates with every person in the state prison in California, many people in federal prisons and, and jails and prisons across America. I'd love to give you the last word of what we could say to our brothers and sisters who are still serving sentences. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Michael, for this opportunity and for all the work that you've been doing over the years. I've always really been impressed with your interest and execution in terms of giving back. That's it's impressive to me. Um, what I say to people is, you know, when I when I get off of uh, this recording, I'm going to go work for another nine or 10 hours. I'm already three hours into my day. I'm going to work out at the end of the day. And I did a little bit of yoga in the morning before I started. I will buy a lottery ticket. I'm still trying to see if I can get that overnight quick win. But what I really want people to hear is the hard work. It's 23 years later and I am still grinding. I think about wellness also. You should think about wellness uh, and take care of yourself at the same time. Um, but if you are not investing in yourself consistently, consistently, throughout the entire journey, um, then you're probably not gonna get to the finish line and recognize that the finish line is important, the journey is much more important. Lean into the journey, that's where the lesson is gonna be learned. I know there'll be dark moments again in the future, but I also know that those dark moments give you a chance to really value the light. And so I look forward to that. Love your story and really appreciate you for being a part of our community. You are now a prison professor. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks a lot, man, take care.